lover. This is more euphemistically a professional male dancing partner. Euphemisms evoke romance. Inspired on reading that Strictly Come Dancing's Michael Ball and Arfie Bell are uh, four pounds twenty and a bag of chips, we're off to northern Italy with the vague hope of finding a Latino lover, a young gigolo italiano. Cincatari, beautiful, like a little safer mouth for that time. In a collection of five villages. This is more architectural atmosphere tourism. You know. The word gigolo is borrowed from the French. Masculino, gigolette, a historical slang from at least the 1800s. A gigolette is a shoulder of rabbit or a, a thigh, or a leg of any little animal, including frogs. Roy Orbison was still singing about gigolette in the 1960s. Oh, they call you gigolette, they say you're the devil's pet, they say beware, for you destroy the heart and soul of every boy. They say that your lips are soft and warm, and they say your touch has a magic charm, but that you're a butterfly flying from guy to guy. Gigolette, gigolette, laugh and lovers cry, kiss and say goodbye, heart made of stone, stay away, leave you alone. You're a fly by night, arms to hold you tight, too late now to forget, and the spell of gigolette. My chance to run away is passed in your arms at last. But I'll take you back to before the French Revolution and the abolition of all monarchy in France. Between 1667 and 1789, the French Revolution. The Salon was an informal education for women where they were able to exchange ideas, receive and give criticism, read their own works and hear the works and ideas of other intellectuals. Many ambitious women used the salon to pursue a form of higher education. These were in individual homes. Some posted. Have to to cool down. The salons of early medieval revolutionary France played an integral role in the cultural and intellectual cool development of France. The salons were seen by contemporary writers as a cultural hub for the upper middle class and aristocracy, responsible for the dissemination of good manners and sociability. They became popular and there were so many homes holding salons, so many hosts of a sort of broad class. The female host of class was often an older woman. They obviously had servants and it varied on who they chose as their servants, what they wanted from them. This first burgeoning of female consciousness, intellectual consciousness, must surely have gone hand in hand with the concept, at least, of the gigolo, if not the word itself. The salons doesn't disappear after the revolution. Penny University is also pop up in coffee shops. The colonialism of the 1500s and mercantile wealth rising gave an opulence and this nurtured elitism among the classes that had it. And the idea of art for art's sake, politesse, civilité and honnête. But also a place of petty scandals and intrigue. The salons were dominated by women and the philosophies of the Enlightenment. Madame de Defand, Madame Roland, Sophie de Condorcet might discuss Jean-Jacques Rousseau and tend towards women's rights. Or we don't like the essay on the character and nature of morals and spirit of women. Rich American women after the First World War descended on Paris and France. Edna Ferber wrote about the gigolo in Woman's Home Companion magazine. The gigolo is a professional male dancing partner. At first glance, gigolo is slang. My conversational French doesn't go as far as I got slang. The gig zig it's not a respectable word. By that time, it's a term of utter contempt, really. Um, gigolo, generally speaking, is a man who lives off women's money. At the mad year of 1922, after the First World War, Gigolo defines as uh, one of those incredible and pathetic male creatures born of war, who for ten francs or more, or even less, would dance with any woman wishing to dance on the crowded floors of public tea rooms, dinner or supper rooms in the cafes, hotels and restaurants of France. Lean, sallow, handsome, expert and unwholesome, one saw them everywhere, their slim waists and sleek heads in juxtaposition to plump, 
respectable American matrons and slender, respectable American flappers. For that matter, feminine respectability of almost every nationality except the French yielded itself to the skillful guidance of the genius gigolo. In the tango or the foxtrot, naturally no decent French girl would have been allowed for a single moment to dance with a gigolo. But America, tall in Europe, like mad, after years of enforced abstinence, outnumbered all other nationalities ten to one. And bear in mind that so many men had died in the trenches. Demand outstripping supply. The word gigolo was borrowed from French gigolette. Si tu veux être ma gigolette, oui, je serai ton gigolo. If you want to be my gigolette, yes, I'll be your gigolo. Gigolette, a young, coquettish, working-class girl frequenting the public dance halls. Gigolo, little young man frequenting the places where the gigolette is found. Grisette, faubourienne, courant des bal public. Folie Robert was one such destination. Molière recule, relu chant, en monte de coeur. That's where a woman has a living boyfriend who tolerates her having, in exchange for payment, regular sexual liaison with other men. Boyfriend is her Creole Luchon, who is proud of having for free what his rivals must pay for. A bit like a stepson with benefits, perhaps, or until her courtiers come up with the goods and put a ring on it. Cutesy abbreviations of names were popular. So we're in 1850s, say, Paris. Now we finally see there especially gigolos and gigolettes, a new word and new morals, which must be explained to those who don't know them. The gigolo is a teenager, a little man, in the same way that a gigolette is a teenager, a meurgule. One occupies the middle ground between a cherub and a Don Juan, half simpleton, half guayluchon. The other is midway between a working class girl and the hussy, half factory girl and half harlot. The former might become a complete greluchon, the latter will most definitely become a harlot, uh, because on the downward path to pleasure it was deemed then, where they are both running, it is easier for men than for women to stop in time and to return to the bosom of honesty. Uh, that uh, depends on how much money they can earn, doesn't it? Really? An uh, honest job. Now, why the collaboration of these two youths? Because the gigolo and the gigolette are both children of the Paris couples and they are similar in many respects. If I dared, I would say that one is the brother and the other is the sister. The pig ignorant gigolette is pleased to be able to babble freely with the equally ignorant gigolo without fearing his smiles and lectures. And to her, he is a lover of no consequence, whom if need be, she would send as an ambassador to a serious lover, and who would run and errand without being offended, being as stranger to decency as to rhetoric. An inconsequential lover, yet lover with all the privileges that this title entails, and with all the expenses that it involves. My little pet name used, or my little different pet name used, or my little different pet name used, says the gigolette to a gigolo. I have my rent to pay the day after tomorrow, and he has only given me half of it. You must make up the remainder. And the gigolo pays up. Unless, using these ladies and gentlemen's slang, he answers, Damn all! But it's an alliance, isn't it? The people in need. And it's a fairly desperate economic alliance of minimums. 1866 Parisian Argot Slang Dictionary. A gigolette, a young woman who has flung her modesty and her cap over the windmills and whose happiness consists of shaking her legs in the public dance halls, especially the disreputable ones. Use um, slang for genre legs. The common people use their legs to dance the jig. Gigueur means dancer. To dance. Gigotto legs, gigots, eyes, so a gigot of mutton or lamb, to shake legs, to dance, uh, gigotta, remuer le gig, dancing, also means to wriggle, 
Mm. Mujigu is also a tall, skinny woman, which poor people were uh, then. Some of these old French words, the similarity of the shape, um, the mandolin like instrument that they used to have, the same name, is a long human leg. In cuisso is a haunch of venison or wild boar. In cuisse is a human thigh, and often all that that beholds. Jigger, to caper, leap, or dance, seems partly to be a British re exporting, British invasion of the jig dance. The wiggle, the expressing the intensity of the action, comes out in the otter of the gigotta. The early use on the English side of the channel of giglet or giglot was more a lewd, wanton woman. A giddy, laughing, romping girl um, when the use of giggle is included. But a flighty, giddy girl is no longer called a gig in English, if you're finding the subtitling of this at all useful for learning. My pre-operative and post-operative transvestite friend have a Shirley Valentine thing going on, they like going to Greece. Um, oh, they'll know. Feeling trapped in a world of domesticity, Shirley, a housewife from Liverpool, England, needs a change in her life before she has another conversation with the walls. When her friend, Jane, invites her on a trip to Greece, the islands, Shirley jumps at the chance upon landing. Jane ditches Shirley for a romantic fling, which means, with another tourist, which means Shirley is left to her own devices. And she wanders the island and meets a taverna owner and falls in love with falling in love and begins to find the joy of life again. She returns to the island after ditching her husband and learns that the taverna owner is a serial romancer but gets a job and lives the life. The serial romancer, like being the pants in the sisterhood of the travelling pants, is undoubtedly a higher form of evolution than outright jealousy that may have marred previous relationships for the female romance tourist. Intimacy gets trotted out as a reason, but I think really control is one of the overwhelming things that gets overlooked. The woman is in control. And while the local man may feel that his virility is being reinforced to have evolved the charms necessary, he's likely to have come from a background with strong female role models. I don't really want to start trotting out clichés that you might need in the day now of Jamaica and seeking out the milk bottles at the airport lounge on arrival. And I don't want to be shy about addressing race and colonialism. Though, by focusing on the romantic escapes of older female travellers to international sex destinations, I'd like to encourage a critical dialogue to the complex interplay of older women's sexuality, ageing and psychological well-being in later life. It has argued that ageing women, especially the representatives of the baby boom generation, often turn to romance tourism to recreate their sexual subjectivity, reconnect with their youthful selves and enhance a sense of self-worth and self-confidence that cannot often be found at home. By reversing age, race, class and the gender-related notions that otherwise would be more complicated to challenge, in their home spaces, older women do the narrative of decline and the double standard of ageing as they show that asexuality and age are not correlated. Although a variety of travel media, advertising and the model of successful ageing promote sex and active engagement with life as beneficial to both physical and emotional well-being, they overlook the fact that the convergence of Leisure travel and sex is closely wedded to a higher vulnerability to sexually transmitted diseases, sex-related risks and um, emotional damage when the holiday fantasy is over. In fact, romance tourism in exotic t destinations, together with promotional mass media and tourism industry, can be even seen as an extension of the discourse of successful ageing in its articulation of sexual pleasure as a means of self-reaffirmation. Self-reaffirmation of propagating anti-aging ideals and of actively engaging with life in later years. Sex and leisure practices in old age should be tackled carefully in order not to create another rather oppressive ideology among older women, 
the current sexual health agenda and policies, apart from providing more efficient health information channels and health policies to prevent the STD, sexual violence and other sex-related risks within touristic settings should empower older women and encourage alternative views towards sexual expressions in later years. The field of travel, health, sexuality has much potential to offer to health promotion, sexuality, risk, tourism studies and wider theoretical debates. Ultimately, there is no single paradigm of the interplay between ageing femininities and sex and leisure travel, but many complex, multidimensional and often problematic meanings that require interdisciplinary investigation and greater communication amongst researchers, perhaps working in the fields of leisure tourism, health, age, sexuality, women's studies and other. Hopefully this will serve as an invitation for a deeper examination on your part of the synergy between older women's sexual expression, successful ageing and romance tourism. That goes beyond the contemporary Western-centred understanding of ageing, femininities and the experience of growing older. And hopefully you can be less judgmental of those women and perhaps even accommodating of those women at home amongst you, next to you. Perhaps you will see them, those invisible people, and they will appreciate being seen. Do you get yours? Holidaying is an opportunity to let go of sense of responsibility and free yourself from social roles, everyday constraints and routines. The ludic nature of leisure tourism may even prompt people to disregard the ethical values of a travel destination and act in ways that are contradictory to regular social norms in the home country. The 1830 holiday, drink too much, eat too much, create too much noise in rowdy games and disco all night long, return to their nine to five respectability. This happens mostly whatever the revelries, which may by them be considered depravities. Is a mature tourist any more ethical? Should they know better if they've experienced or been exposed to more to complain about? Who says they should need to be a better person on holiday escapisms? Which is a marketing tool for the travel industry. But those working for tips don't see much of it. And what percentage of romances turn into relationships? By employing the power of sex, the mass media has commercialised and exploited sexuality. And this is in large part responsible for the rift between left-wing born naturism and swingers, which to a large extent divides between the FFN and the FKK of France and Germany respectively, though obviously not exclusively. The four S's that the industry trots out for decades aren't sun, sea, sand and second home hunting like they are to me. Sexual fantasies over time evolve. What brings on love, life and laughter? There's an ebb and flow of motivations. Some stagnate. Christian Lecoq has died at 103, a nudist of the 1920s, when the area was for neck-to-knee design swimsuits and promotional brochures for Hawaii with Pan Am showing bare-breasted native women beckoning tourists with garlands. Today, dating sites of Tinder and the like have changed their app so that you can place your pin, your location, ahead of time to where you're going on holiday. Secondary and tertiary towns get overlooked as not economically viable and time and effort viable. But it's the developed countries, big cities, that are these internet-savvy romance tourists' destinations. London is top. Netherlands is popular as well for people finding like-minded individuals. The casuality of some of this is the taboo, really, but not for those initiated. What capitalism sells through lotions and fashion is a contemporary Western understanding of beauty and sexual appeal. Comes secondary to gratification and desire, and some sort of effort-benefit analysis when swiping left or right. These countries that now face the new trend are more able to deal with any exploitation of abuse, trafficking or nationalism. The power dynamic lesson and control fleeting in time. Any racism bias, exoticism, 
is marginalised and colonialism is eating itself and a sort of anonymity is maintained. Differentness and otherness could be seen as celebrated without coercive control of vast inequalities of wealth. Erotic, Greek, low, implies a range of sexual desires and perhaps dichotomies or novelties not too stuck in nostalgia. Caliente need not be the antonym of intelligent. Travelling to a third world country to feel desirable and attractive is still always a manifestation of the complex interplay of unequal gender relations, class structures, low income, cultural traits, sexual roles and socio-cultural, political and historical backgrounds. Sex tourism today continues to echo social relations of power and the maintenance of local racialized identities, attitudes and practices that were formed during colonialism, which shows that the location of sex-related travel can never be separated from its social and political context. But that is changing. Back to where broadband speed is greatest. The lords and ladies of the app lording it over their little minions, their serfs of their pre-colonial fiefdom may be where we're heading now, or because it's so invisible, where we already are. Yes, we're liberated from a chronic round of pregnancy and childbirth, but has the right wing enabled this libertine liberation, this increased sexualisation of women? Pleasure, sense of closeness and excitement, and their vitality, sense of happiness, self-esteem, and ability for intimacy need not be signs and markers for psychological well-being, but enablement of active lives and personal expression is a good antidote, alternative to loss, frailty and decay that is how you might be judged as you're getting older in the past. The cohort of the consumer society might champion autonomy, but they don't have to feel any pressure for hedonistic leisure, self-expression or mass consumption as mass media emanates, disseminates. Within capitalism, pleasure-oriented consumption can be so many things. A holiday in search of a gigolo is so often a compensation that we can existentially justify. The holiday mood has a lingering effect of a sense of fulfilment and happiness. Scrutinising of the smorgasbord, a memory to hark back to for that woman in the street that you may assume as asexual in your ageist mind, and she's having a giggle at you. A naively sentimental, simple and frivolous young girl was a midinette. Still is, rarely, but it just used to be a seamstress from a fashion house popping out for lunch for an hour and having a herring with a couple of soup and pennies before Frank's for her midday meal. 
I got all worked up like a midget walking along. A grisette from the cheap grey fabric took on a different tone. The petite main, a small hand, a no more terms for a seamstress. All reputedly sexually promiscuous. They were associated with the Lorettes, women of the demi monde, who in the mid 19th century lived mainly near Notre Dame de Lorette, a church in the ninth arrondissement of Paris. I, didn't you, always assumed that gigolo was an Italian word. I'd have even placed it with the tango dance from South America and made it Spanish or Portuguese before I'd have guessed that it was a French word. But a lot of young men have been given confidence from the attentions of an older woman, and an older woman, perhaps without ever having children of her own, gives confidence as part of her raison d'être. And there were undoubtedly lower middle class salons that catered for the same with their gigolos, servants, as the men and their little legs, gigolette, got elsewhere, traditionally, shall we say. Bringing things up to the modern day, the wealthy aristocratic woman on grand tour, taking young gigolo lovers and the Victorian era, I suppose you'd describe. Then, after the Second World War in the 1950s, the Roman Spring of Mrs Stone with Lynn Mirren, a repressed old woman's sexual awakening, where there's the veneer of illusion with the auntie-mother-type character friend that is the pimp from Mythic Mrs Stone and then a series of gigolos that don't know their place and abject poverty in the background always feeding fresh meat her way. The 1950s where small gangs of youths kept call women in the street, routinely, like a birthright. Not sad to say that this trip has taught that those days are pretty much gone in northern Italy. The relative sexual equality of the left-wing politics, making for a better lot of following. Breakfast at Tiffany's, Audrey Hepburn and George Peppard was contemporary. Almost two decades late, uh, just a gigolo, David Bowie, Richard Gere, American gigolo. Let's forget Deuce Bigelow. A Susanna York film in 2005, a French Gigolo 2008. But this subject's partly in my head after watching Mrs Stone. Um, and then after that it was suggested to me Aston Kutcher and Anne Hesch in Spread from 2009. But actors talking direct to camera. I always find a bit disturbing as well as the subject matter. Today the less than aristocratic the woman looking for a gigolo with less economic leverage doesn't need to go to a poorhouse or a prison and be a sponsor and pay off the debts of um, young men trying to get out. They can go abroad or have colonialism bring the world to them at home. Now turned neo-colonialism or post-colonial economic migration for romance and intimacy. My former lodger, a Central East African university educated Divorcee, seemingly a booking himself, being beneath him, now has a very large, very vociferous, older, milk-white woman that would have been his first choice. But an ideal compromise, he gets to use her car uninsured. Romance and intimacy, sex tourists. Female sex tourists travel all around the world. They might dress it up as being situational sex tourists, not intentionally involving themselves in sexual encounters with local men. The original non-sexual agenda may be somewhat of a guise. From Northern Europe, Australia and America, 60 to 100,000 women, 70% of them revisiting. Visit Albania, Bulgaria, Cambodia, Croatia, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Gambia, Greece, Haiti, Indonesia, Italy, Jamaica, Kenya, Morocco, Philippines, Portugal, Romania, Serbia, Spain, Tanzania, Thailand, Turkey and Vietnam. Guile and guise, much different in each of these Kenya compared to Spain or Italy. Kenya and Jamaica are very different again. Japanese and Australian women love Bali. 45 to 50 year old being the majority. They perhaps feel rejected by men in the developed countries where they come from for being overweight and older. Find that in Kenya perhaps this is suddenly reversed. There yeah, they are romanced, appreciated and loved by them. The costs of little presents are fairly inconsequential and far more easily justified. Romance tourism is a different relationship. 
may have started as situational or a pickup, not all and vulnerable, though invariably targeted. For most romance tourists in the Caribbean, lust and monetary value is secondary to romance and courtship. It's an issue of gender identification. Gender identity is a relational construct. The Western woman who seeks to break from conventional roles within a different kind of relationship with men in order to realise a new gender identity. That they've got the increasing independence and financial self-reliance to explore these new behaviours for themselves. But romance tourists with this motive in, vo- in mind cling to underdeveloped countries to find romantic relationships are a type of colonialist, as are the men that do it, of course. The titillation of the exotic, each can see each as a personal pleasure, but there are also those that play the long game and the encouragement of falling in love is only for the greater reward. Romance is the importance of passion over transaction. The inversion of an outmoded male dominance and female subordination is, is perhaps just a niche, but a thin veneer for many, adding respectability. But with many returning, as many times a year as their finances will allow, and often to the same persons, it's not dissimilar to an overseas foreign worker sending money back home to their family. But sadly, the affordability aspect of going abroad trumps neocolonialism and racism. A 40-year-old woman isn't likely to be having children with the rich boy. Control by one power over a dependent area or people. I'm using here as a description of colonial. Here the area of control is the poor person's body, an emotional state. After 40 or 50 years, when it's becoming locally normative, there's a peer pressure, a generational subculture that skews perceptions from both parties. Gambia, as a, as a tourist destination, is... It's actively discouraging the decades-long practice that it's become synonymous with the female sex tourist. is being passed over, seemingly wanting to clean up its act. Whether this is a rejection of the commercialisation can't really be too clear. It may just be that it's in decline because of the effective use of the internet, adding a different dimension to meetups, hookups or pickups, whatever you want to call them. For some, there's bound to be a blindness that develops, which is perhaps a step in the right direction. Though to say there's any positive discrimination that is really only stereotyping, I might be taking evangelising of the carnivalesque a bit too far. Racism is one of the factors that's placed the Mediterranean gigolo out of the market of mass tourism, of such bulk today. Suspended judgement in that foreign reality, perhaps their own and their perceived home, tended family and um, the adverse racism implicit, rather than unconscious negative or abstract liberalism, may be put on hold or deny their so subtly racially motivated behaviour, rather intrinsic in the control. But the greater part of that control is 
capitalism, economic control, which didn't really exist in bulk until imperialism, with the Pope's blessing to enslave anyone that wasn't Catholic, really. And of course the British industrialisation of the slave trade. Previously all strangers from outside of the village were tid with the same suspicion and contempt. The Gambia is now resisting its 21st century female tourist colonial oppressors, though the locals, in abject polity, don't necessarily share this, that feel they can endure the power imbalance for the lifestyle benefits. As a house husband at best, they're never going to be on an equal footing, but something closer may materialise after years and decades in the same relationship. The exoticism or the exoticization is the racial discrimination. Distinction, exclusion, restriction or preference based on race, colour, descent or national or ethnic origin that has the purpose of or effect of nullifying or impairing the recognition, enjoyment or exercise on an equal footing of human rights and fundamental freedoms in the political, economic, social, cultural or any other field of public life. But this is private life made public. Ethical tourism is partly in the mind. Not objectifying a culture is difficult. Finding something that is an other is partly what the whole industry is based on. The travel industry. The other, the exotic other, is anything outside of the tourist social home norms. Too often including the glamorisation of wealth and the ability for conspicuous consumption. And that's intrinsic supremacism. A Northern European woman might find their freedom releases in Egypt with a hotel waiter. That hotel waiter may seek the same in sub-Saharan Africa, Black Africa as they call it. Or the Northern European may just leapfrog all of that. There's been 40 or 50 years now of the creation of biases that can quickly become outdated. But Thomas Cook's cheap flights have enabled most socio-economic groups of Northern Europe to indulge like Edward Prince of Wales in Paris, fin de siècle style. Capitalism is the cause of the carnivalesque, claiming the bodies of the persons of comparatively less mental capacity. The other, not like me, may be claimed or denied, or subconscious. The ageing femininity, hunting the noble savage of Victorian literature, may consider their pushing boundaries for femininity. Feminism redefined, but there's many other overlapping circles that they tarnish and tread in very traditional ways. This will mess up the auto subtitles. On y vont au fond, on y vont surtout des gigolos et gigolettes. Un mot nouveau et des morts nouvelles qui ont fait expliquer à ceux qui ne le connaissent pas. Le gigolo est un adolescent, un petit homme, comme la gigolette est un adolescent, une meilleure Le homme qui ont le meilleur être chabotant et tombant, moite le corps et moite le chant. Le autre tient 
Maintenant, pourquoi la collaboration de ces deux jeunesses Par quel le gigolo et le gigolo sont tous deux enfants de pavé de Paris et qu'ils se résemblent à une foule de côtes Si je essaie, je dirais qu'une laisse le frère et l'autre la sœur. La gigolette qui est non comme une carpe, n'est-ce pas fâché de pouvoir babiller un son et s'avec le gigot aussi non qu'elle. Sans redoute ses sourires et les lessions. Et puis pour elle, c'est une amende sans conséquence qui a besoin d'elle vrai comme ambassadeur chez une amende sérieuse et qui irait sans être obfusque de la commission. La délectesse lui est aussi une commune de la rhétorique. À mon sens, conséquence, ma cependant, à mon sens, tout le privilège que ce titre comporte, et aussi avec tout l'échange qu'il entraîne avec soi. Mon petit Ketol, mon petit Gust, oh, mon petit Polite, dans la gigolette, à son gigolo. J'ai mon terme après, après demain, et il ne m'en a donné que la moitié. Il fait que tu me fasses la reste. Et le gigolo s'est exécuté. À mon employé, l'argot de ces dames et ces messieurs, il ne lui répond. Du flingue. 